Lee. I'm the founder and managing partner of Lexogen. Uh, I will introduce myself in a minute, but I first want to welcome all of you uh, to this session on a very, very important topic at one of the uh, most useful conferences that I attend uh, through the year, which is the Horasis Global Meeting. And we are attending this meeting at a pretty significant time for many of us. And I welcome all of you and thanks for making the time to be here. And a quick intro uh, about myself. I'm uh, the founder and manager for Lexogen, which is a law firm uh, headquartered in India with office in Singapore. We do a lot of, uh, you know, advisory corporate work. And I'm personally a transactional lawyer with about 24 plus years of experience. And I have a very strong passion for uh, the Asian sector, having advised on the first uh, Greenfield PPP airport project where I represented the government of, in, uh, government of one of the states where the first airport was coming up. And uh, that was the sponsor of the project. Um, but I basically do a lot of M&A, private equity and venture capital work. That's what I And we are here today to discuss a very fascinating the topic we have for discussion today is the field of transportation. In terms of uh, the importance of transportation, I hardly need to state why it's important. Uh, as we all know, from the, it is probably one of the worst, first cases of uh, you know, innovation and invention by humankind. And it continues to be a very important factor so the, one of the most disruptive moments, of course, was when the wheel was discovered and the wheel uh, was modified in many forms. Then the wheel became wings, then the wheel became uh, fins to swim with across you know, oceans and so on. Now we have craft. So that wheel has taken us a long way and the transportation industry uh, has only contents of its importance from strength to strength. And why has the transportation industry been so important? It has pretty much been the guiding force or the guiding uh, you know, uh, supporting infrastructure uh, behind the growth of the global economy, uh, be it everyday commutes uh, that we all have to rely on, or be it international transport of, uh, you know, goods. And, uh, it plays a very, very important role, and uh, we hardly need to, you know, talk about the importance. It's a very critical cog of the global economy that would not be a stretch by uh, any uh, way of looking at it. And uh, if the transportation part of it were to be taken away even today, the global economy, in my opinion, would shrink. We have, had, we have seen two years of the pandemic where uh, various parts of the world have been locked down or not, uh, depending on where you are. But nonetheless, the, you know, uh, the way the transportation economy has been affected has had a domino effect on various other aspects Many other industries have suffered a severe loss because of the transportation being crippled. And this session, though, is not about the past and why and how transportation came to be important. This session is about the future of transportation. And in these Horasis meetings, we always uh, like to have discussions or, uh, you know, looking into the future kind of crystal ball gazing questions, if you will. And we always have a very fascinating panel of speakers to address those topics. And when we talk about the future of uh, transportation, we have to bear in mind that one of the major influences in the future of transportation, as it is increasingly becoming, uh, is technology. And technology is the other area which is, you know, uh, you know, become the most, when I say technology, I mean information technology. And information technology, as we all know, has become a um, more and more of an influencer in every other field. And transportation is no exception. Transportation continues to be disrupted by and will continue to be even more disrupted by the advances in information technology. You know, be it the use of IoT, be it artificial intelligence or machine learning, I think we have ways to travel, smarter ways to travel, and, uh, you know, most to get the travel done. And we also have to talk about some of these technologies, exciting technologies that the transportation industry is seeing, you know, be it Hyperloop or be it, you know, supersonic jets, which have just been announced or a deal has been announced by Boom. And, and all those exciting things are happening in the transportation space uh, where we are talking about 
driverless cars. Now there's a lot of uh, focus on driverless trucks. Eventually, we'll be looking at driverless ships, maybe on you know, planes. So I think these are all going to be very exciting trends, which will make transportation safer and faster. The other important cog that we need to look at when we look at transportation, the other important prism through which we need to look at uh, transportation is the prism because all the growth and the convenience the transportation industry has brought us has come at a price. Though. We all know that. And it's a huge price that we're paying. And that right that the transportation industry has on the uh, environment globally. Uh, it's a small fact that 24% global greenhouse gas emissions worldwide are attributable to the transportation industry. Uh, it's a pretty significant number if you look at the whole uh, variety of factors that contribute to climate change. But 24% coming from one factor is pretty meaningful. And so we need to also talk about the future of transportation, not only from point of view of how much we can improve efficiencies and how much more we can help make life convenient for us and make us richer as a people. But we also need to think about the fact that whatever changes that we bring in in the future in transportation has to keep climate change in mind. So in other words, it has to be sustainable strategies for the future in the transportation space. And to talk about this today, uh, I'd like to introduce you. We have a very, very stellar panel uh, of uh, panelists who I will be posing some interesting questions to, and hopefully you'll find them interesting as well. Uh, the first speaker we have here is Nico Anton. So Nico is from the Netherlands. He is the executive chairman at Connect. He has had a long career of, you know, working Connect. And Connect is the leading um, financially independent triple helix network organization, which was originally created as a collaborative initiative uh, amongst Dutch industry, the scientific community, and government. And it's focused on smart mobility and logistics. And it has slowly started extending its reach and influence beyond the Netherlands, and it now has a more of an international focus as well. So welcome to the panel, Nico. Next, I would like to introduce to you Hugo Roper. Hugo owns GLG Logistics Systems. Uh, it's a company based in Geneva, Switzerland, that provides uh, technology-based logistics management solutions. Hugo is a serial entrepreneur and a veteran in industry with experience of 46 years in the fields of logistics and software development. Next up, we have Lauren Smith, Jr. Lauren is the president of Skyline Policy Group, a leading strategic and advisory firm based in Washington, D.C., in the USA, that has a special focus on transportation. Over the last decade, Lauren has done some very impactful policymaking work, especially in the field of transportation, and written more than 500 research notes and given uh, plus speeches relating to transportation policy over the past decade. Welcome to the panel, Lauren. Next, we have Clyde Hutchinson. And well, the one thing I forgot to mention about Lauren, which is an important thing, is that he was part of the U.S. Department of Transportation as a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy, and he recently exited that role uh, and moved to Skype. Clyde Hutchinson is our next panelist. He's a partner of Journey Partners Island, and he's a general partner at Team ABC, which is a VC fund based out of Dublin, Mexico, Vienna, and Dubai, which is focused on funding early stage innovation in sustainable transportation and tourism. In addition to his long and illustrious career in sustainable tourism and digital transformation, Clyde also has been involved in setting up and supporting several startup innovation-related initiatives. Welcome, Clyde. 
Lastly, we have Rohan Shetty, who's a very interesting guy. Now, Rohan's been an entrepreneur with more than 30 years of experience focused on ship broking and shattering. After a very successful business in Dubai, he has recently relocated to the hills in southern India and from there runs a technology company called Icon Maricon that's focused on sustainable chemical technologies to disrupt the industry. With that, I will now uh, move to uh, the questions part of this. And first, the way we're going to do this session, I'm going to throw one question that is going to be a common question for all of your panelists, because I'm sure uh, this is an overarching question on which each of you can add your you know, respective uh, points of view with your you know, diverse backgrounds in the transportation industry. And so the first question I have is, <clears throat> it's almost axiomatic now that transportation is like a bad boy polluter worldwide, whether in developed countries or in emerging countries. It contributes almost a quarter of the global greenhouse gas emissions, which we just talked about a few minutes ago. So given this, how do you think can world leaders, or how should world leaders plan for a sustainable future that sees transformationally reduced greenhouse gas emissions from global transportation, on the other hand, maintaining the pace of growth that industry uh, you know, and consumerist industry craves for. So to answer this question, I will first invite Nico. Thank you, VJ, for your question. Um, if you look uh, at the future of mobility and how to reshape the entire system, I think we are in a perfect storm right now where we can make use of. Um, you see very big trends who are uh, changing our society. Uh, our economic system, our uh, society, uh, and uh, those are the digitalization of our society. Data is the key in getting an insight in, okay, what are my emissions? Um, but also, how can I collaborate in a better way? In logistics, you see a lot of um, examples how collaborating even between competitors can make the system uh, more sustainable and show also to other companies, to other industries, but also to society, we can make the system more sustainable. We need a lot of time and I'm, uh, I want to speed up. So I don't want to listen too much about, okay, this is not working. I think we have to, uh, to make use of this trend. The second trend you see in society now is disruption. Um, you are getting companies, even in mobility and logistics, who are larger than countries, for example, uh, Amazon. Well, how can you make use of those companies in changing our society? And we also need to have a change in human behavior. Uh, if I order something via the internet, I can I get it delivered to my home for free. Well, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's also no thing as a free delivery there's a price to pay and it, we have to pay the real price for our mobility system in every modality. So the fact that certain modalities don't pay taxes or whatsoever is uh, not a sustainable model. Uh, mobility is, a, is very good for us, but we have to pay the real price for it. Like water, like a list that to your, uh, for your home. And if we make use of the digitalization and this disruption, we can go to a uh, carbon-free economy, to a decarbonization of our society. And the first thing is to think big. Well, we have the, the, the goals uh, as agreed in Paris in the summit, but then act locally, act little, but just start acting. The, the, the biggest change we have to make is not to talk, so not to uh, talk the talk, but to walk the walk and really make the steps forward. You also can make use of uh, legislation. So also, uh, yeah, make use of the law to change behavior, but also the way industry is uh, working. 
and in the end make it a fair system by uh, introducing more carbon trade uh, systems. And I think together digitalization and disruption can make use of the decarbonization. And to end my contribution, it's all about balancing between welfare and well-being. Thank you, Vijay. We cannot hear you, Vijay. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. That was a wonderful response. You highlighted some very good points. Nothing is free. That's a very, very valid point to make, especially in the context of trans transportation. Uh, next, then I will, uh, you know, ask Lauren to step in and share his views uh, on this. So thank you, VJ. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I think Nico hit a lot of the points. It, COVID is in many ways an accelerant on trends that were already in force when you're talking about uh, the development of uh, freight infrastructure and the importance of you know, global you know, technology and logistics giants like Amazon. I think I think comparing these companies to uh, you know uh, you know almost nation sized companies themselves, I think is exactly on point because some of the 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 the, uh, the uh, lines of power and that the way these uh, these companies are negotiated with, uh, and it's been true for decades with with uh, with the, the largest companies uh, having that. That level of um, that level of importance on the world stage, but now I think we're really seeing it, especially in this interconnected environment. Um, but again, you know, you have uh, you have a situation where more and more people are able to order the things that they want uh, and 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 have it delivered to them, and not just you know not just packages and you know, toilet paper. It's it's paper towels, and now um, and now it's even your regular groceries. All of these things delivered right to the house, and this requires a uh, a, a vast uh, global logistical network, uh, and we're going to need to figure out. And even minor tweaks to that network have huge ripple effects uh, on the economy. And uh, with so much of the world dealing with the economic fallout of COVID nineteen, it's really helped us sort of step into, you know, in, in some ways, this is the beginning of the twenty first century, where we see how are we going to. Uh, how are we going to accommodate that and deal with challenges like with the environment and make sure that we have a, have a system that is going to be stable for the long term uh, and allow uh, regions of the world that are still developing uh, to reap the benefits of modern technology. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly exciting time. I'm, you know, I'm very optimistic about the possibilities for development here, but there are real challenges. Thank you, Lorraine. As we all keep noting, uh, is no topic can be discussed without a reference to COVID and what it has, you know, brought upon us, and also about how, in some cases, it can become an opportunity for us to, you know, fix things that have been wrong for decades. So, uh, your experience from the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation Science, uh, I'm, I'm sure, gives you a lot of perspective on how things can be fixed. And I'm going to come back to your second question with some specific pointers on that. But thank you for your inputs on this one. Uh, next up, I'm going to ask uh, you know Rohan to go with his uh, perspective on this. Sorry about that, Vijay. Thank you. Thank you so much, and it's glad to. Be, I'm glad to be here with you, fine folks. Um, I think uh, this bad boy. Well, you know, it's to put a label on stuff and be. Uh, but I think one needs to be a bit more objective on this particular topic. Now, I, I'm, I'm from the commercial and operational side of the international transportation industry, for, and I've been here for over three decades in really the back end part of the business. And I must uh, first emphasize that all transportation, uh, Nico referred to it, is based on a derived demand principle, okay? And international transportation more so than that. It's just one of the many forms of um, human activity that uh, contributes to the big hole in the sky and what have you. To put things in context, from an international deep sea point of view, our industry is responsible for over 80% of global international trade by volume. So that's about, let's say, 12 billion metric tons uh, and about 14 trillion US dollars by value. And the general assessment is that it generates 800 plus, I think, 850 uh, million uh, tons of CO2 footprint. And this is diminishing uh, at a rate of about 5 to 6% uh, annually in absolute terms. So for, for, for world leaders, to plan for a sustainable future, they would need to collaborate 
even more and let our industry regulatory bodies you know we've got a bunch of regulatory bodies under the aegis of the united nations and so many other private or semi private uh, organizations uh, these bodies need to work together as one on systems for the common good instead of all these disparate regimes each one is coming up with their own things uh governments will and leaders will have to understand that they need to incentivize reduction in co2 emissions and this will need to be a medium to long term vision and they, they will have to encourage us to make it the actual the new as new uh, make new investments in floating assets that generally have very high capital cost and our assets have a 2 to 3 decade life span so it's not so easy to make uh, you know quick changes no no there's no easy solution things are happening in our world we are we are looking at 2050 uh, for zero emissions right that's our target <clears throat> or at least get close to that but to get close to theoretical zero people are talking about balancing games like carbon pricing and uh, taxes but that's that's something quite different politicians paying lip service to this to these programs will not work you know it's all about action and the need for here and now one needs to look at the total value chain from production of the fossil fuel right up to the consumption and beyond and this is easier said than done when you have 200 sovereign nations each with their own agenda and aspirations separately uh, uh, nico talked about uh, large companies so these transnational corporations they are heavily invested in global trade and they will also have to participate uh, and this will take this will, uh, you know direct impact decisions are very very important now we are talking about policy level decisions to incentivize research and development and roll out the future of non fossil based fuels and i believe true change happen when we see the difference on the ground when we are able to wean ordinary folks from their fossil fuel guzzling commuter vehicles and so on and so forth converting them to alternative energy do our leaders have the political will to make ground breaking decisions and to facilitate this change i don't know i i'm i'm pretty sure some of them do but not all of them but one thing i want to respectfully remind all of you and the out here the sea offers us the cheapest form of transport on a ton mile base when governments do realize this and stop treating this golden goose as a pariah we will see the change and what do they need to do focus on infrastructure proper supply chain for the future and ensure that any new assets will not be left in the lurch when the next government or policy maker comes across uh you know across to the uh, to uh, when he take, takes over so that's about it and um, i'm of course speaking from a environment where there's rule of law and what we call a democratic uh, uh you know that's all i have to say right great great thank you rohan i i knew you would jump on the big uh, you know bad boy uh, tag yeah thank you for that. i think it worked and i think it's equally going to work with hugo who i know has some pretty strong views on this as well So you go may I invite you to offer your perspectives on I will join Rowan also to get a little bit the bad boy image away from us uh first of all you said in the introduction that transportation got us very far in the world got us closer together and could uh, bring prosperity almost all over the world and it's an important tool laws of the future to close close the gap between rich and poor. I'm not too happy with the figures to present always the 24%. 24% includes all transportation, including the transportation of people. And if we look at the figures uh, closer, then only 10% are, and 0.6% are, contri- uh, are contributed by real transportation. Even this is not very correct because in the air there are still the passengers in it however uh, looking into this i think we have to see the proportions as ron said the ocean is a big transporter uh, but a very small polluter compared to the tonnage transport uh, the air is a very little part it, uh, it's always stigmatized in the uh, uh in the news etc air pollution etc etc the air is the smallest polluter of all of them. uh again there most of it in the air it's of the total air it's only 0.5 which is contributed to uh passenger 
uh, uh, to, to cargo movements. The rest is passenger. So what we need to do is to separate this because the solutions for moving people is different than for moving cargo. And I think that our politicians do have to understand that, uh, that we need to separate this. Then I think we need to see priorities. Uh, about 70% is done by trucks on the road where we have various options to look into it. Uh, Nico said that, but behaviors, waste, uh, etc., etc., which we have, whether it's with Amazon or return shipments, uh, because I just order stuff uh, to try it on the weekend and send it back on Monday. If we see, we have about a percentage of 40 to 50 percent return within the uh, fashion industry, which is a complete waste. Not even considering that most of this is afterwards, uh, afterwards uh, destroyed. Uh, the cargo, the returns are destroyed and not even reused. But looking into this, uh, we have a lot of empty trucks running around. Uh, the trucks are not full, so massification would be, again, a behavior, uh, education, that more, ma uh, more massification will be done in order to avoid empty trips, etc., etc. Uh, I also agree with Nico, we will find more solutions with digitalizations to better use of the equipment and the volume uh, all over. On the ships, actually, we don't need it, bro, and everything is full. <laughs> Uh, that's beyond digitalization, the actual situation. However, I believe that uh, the future is in technology. And uh, the technology is invented. It's here. It's just bloody expensive. We have hydrogen solutions in Switzerland. We have, in the meantime, 25 trucks running without any CO2 emissions, all on hydrogen. Hugo, if I may interrupt, sorry. On the technology, in fact, I have some specific question to throw at you in my second question. So if you don't mind, can we take up the technology part of it in the second question? Okay, I can do it. Also because I'm conscious that we have a, you know, a very short time window here and, you know, five very, very experienced people to take the views of, yeah? So I'm just going to move to Clyde on this one, on the first question, your views, please, Clyde. Um, well, I'm lucky to come last, so I can agree with everybody. Uh, so I think there's some salient points. I think I would agree with Lauren that we're in a, a really interesting point in the evolution of transportation. This is unprecedented at times. I come from the aviation industry where we've virtually had a full stop in an industry, and we're about to see... Uh, a return to travel that we have never seen in the history of humanity. Uh, shipping has never been busier. Uh, airlines are rapidly looking at how they can be cargo holders. Uh, technology has been rapidly adopted. Uh, shipping is becoming more digital than it's ever been before. So for me, this is a crucial point because I think we're going through a, 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 almost a fourth industrial revolution in transportation. And I think one of the biggest challenges we face is that the, the problem is, is not the transportation as such, it's there's two major problems. There's one, how do you connect air, land and sea transportation and make it more efficient? And COVID has really identified that that's been a really huge challenge. And secondly, there is not an expectation that transportation within the next 30 years will be emission free. So how do we do that? Uh, how do we do that? And how can we make sure that the expectations around transportation are maintained? So for me, this is the most exciting time. I think as an investor, it's amazing. The amount of new stuff I'm seeing at the moment is, is astonishing. So I, I'm super excited. Great to hear that spoken like a true VC because there's always opportunity in diversity, right? So in adversity, sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. 
So, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for the answers to the first question. Now, I'm going to throw separate questions to each of you, you know, based on your backgrounds and your rich experience. So, this time, I'm going to call upon Rohan first. So, my question for you, Rohan, is, uh, you know, you spent a very long career as an international ship broker and chartering planes for clients. How do you think, you know, the shipping and air transport industry are going to greenify themselves, if you will, over the next couple of decades? Um, yeah, thanks for that, uh, Vijay. The thing is, you know, for the most part, as everyone here on the panel has said, everyone's already working on long-term strategies to greenify ourselves. Uh, I don't know. My, I, I mean, I know less about the aviation industry than I do, obviously, of shipping. But to the best of my knowledge, from the aviation standpoint, this segment is primarily working on engine efficiencies and, uh, you know, similar uh, uh, structural concepts that will have a positive change. And like Hugo talked about, you know, the the media, you know, hypes up a lot of, uh, you know, these negatives. But the fact is we're all moving towards positive change. Now, take shipping, for example. Our modern, in, our modern industry is actually several centuries old when we left sail power for steam. So there is incremental change across the board, and a lot of this is due to modern technology, and more so due to specific investments in technology and new ways to do business. And although I said the industry is slow to change, when they do change, there will be a massive movement towards a greener future. So here are some specific points. Lowering the carbon footprint with a gradual phase out of older vessels. Don't forget 25 to 30 years of average age and adoption of alternative fuels and propulsion systems in new buildings. LNG, of course, liquefied natural gas, I believe will be the first move. We already have hybrid ships. It's already happening, followed by hydrogen, ammonia, and of course, electric power phase in and phase out, probably some sort of hybrid system. And of course, interestingly, back to basic wind assist. So we are going back to sales to help us save time and save money. Folks talk about LNG without considering that this is actually methane and is not really as efficient as one would like it to be. Engineering efficiencies, um, improvements in design, larger vessels, forget about the ever given in the Suez Canal, uh, route and voyage optimization. We're getting a bit smarter when the way we do things. Slow steaming, uh, slow steaming, you're gonna have frustrated customers. Probably they can't return their products as fast as they can or even order them as fast. Now, of course, New research and development. So the VC guys, they're, they're, yeah, they're, 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 they're all over the place, right? Looking for great opportunities. And there are scores and scores of people all over the world working towards this common objective. And there will be, I'm very confident, several disruptive technologies that change the way we view and use fuel. Now, there's a lot of new and professional money going into shipping. And I believe several of these investment programs will have caveats and riders uh, that call for greener technologies. So I'm happy to give you this money, but here are the conditions. And as I, I take my own company, right? I, Icon Mary Kim, part of my group. Several of my colleagues who are scientists and you know uh, uh, research guys, they're involved in the development of, for example, a new patented chemical technology for our industry. Sure. I give you an example of one chemical. Uh, in the conventional context, if you put your hand with some pollutants uh, in a pail of hydrochloric acid, you'll be lucky to get your bones back. But what we have done is change the molecular structure of this acid so you get your hand back but the pollutant disappear and this is patented technology which we are just introducing and we are one among hundreds of companies doing stuff like that so Absolutely. things are happening um, the overall yeah. consumption of fossil fuel will reduce and this, this itself will reduce the carbon footprint because we have to transport fossil fuels all, all across the world and of course you know lobbying groups uh, will get their act together and uh, you know make changes for the benefit of all of us. Thank you, Rohan. That was very, very fascinating. I'm glad to hear about all these steps being taken by your industry. And I hope that long-term solutions will emerge from them. Hugo, I'm uh, gonna come back to you. Sorry, I interrupted you earlier, but that is only because I have this detailed question. I know you're the technology guru here amongst us. In today's panel, uh, you've been involved in logistics related technologies for the long time. So my question to you is, you know, based on your deep experience in logistics technology and software, uh, if I were to ask you to pick, uh, you know, two technologies, and I'm asking you this because I'm from Bangalore, which is called the Silicon Valley of India, and we hear a lot of buzzwords about, about what's going to be the next, you know, big technology that's going to disrupt transportation. 
but I'd love to have your take on, you know, if you were to pick two technologies that will push us uh, towards a greener and sustainable future, but at the same time would make commercial sense, what would they be and why? I mean, uh, I definitely believe in uh, hydrogen solutions in the future. Uh, we are already running uh, 25 trucks in Switzerland every day without any CO2. Uh, it's not complicated, it's just expensive. And uh, I believe also on the sideway, although in pollution uh, perspectives, uh, the air is not so important as the uh, road, uh, but also there we have alternative fuels, we have power to liquid fuels. Again, the same problem, it's too expensive. So what I think, what it is important, the solution, maybe not the solution, but the technologies. We have the technology to move forward, but it needs enormous investment. And if I see over the weekend that we can agree now G7 for 15% minimum tax all over the world, then we also could decide on incentive taxes all over the world, make it uh, just and correct and considering the different markets and market powers uh, to raise money on state uh, 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 incentive taxes, which again uh, was mentioned before has to be global. It's a global problem. We have to solve it globally together. Raising money, let's say if you raise some transportation per kilo, I mean, everybody is now talking about airline tickets of uh, people to raise CO2 taxes on airlines. And then the, the politicians want to uh, uh, redistribute it back to, to, to families with four children and six children, whatever. For me, this is just sending money around, making stuff more expensive and sending afterwards the money around. I fully would understand to have such incentive taxes. Let's say a third uh, of the total volume needed by incentive taxes, which should trigger two thirds of investments that Clyde can invest uh, into new technologies and solutions. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, with such incentive taxes, uh, we can move forward very fast. It's just a question of implementation, make it better, what we already have invented. Great, great. Thank you, Hugo. Now, because we are running short of time, I'm going to, you know, cut down the time available to the remaining three speakers with my apologies, profuse apologies. But slide quickly, how do you think your, you know, venture capital private equity industry can, uh, you know, contribute to, you know, you know, being a disruptive force in pushing uh, the transportation industry in the right direction in terms of having that balance between sustainability and profitability? So my role is... Uh, is to invest in risky technologies and innovations, albeit with a capital risk. So to make sure that these technologies are getting into corporates. One thing we always do is we work really closely with corporates to make sure that we are implementing solutions. Because one of those number one challenges is it's not the technology, it's how you implement the technology. And I think we're at this point where we have, especially in shipping, you're getting a consensus with the CEO of Marsh, uh, Marsh Shipping last week saying, asking for a $150 carbon tax to make sure that the industry is, is going to implement these solutions. So for me, the challenge is not finding technology. It's how do we implement the technology? My role is to find the technology supported it when it's at a risky stage, de-risk it for industry and help industry ad adopt it. And we're seeing so many new things. Uh, I, I kind of laughed when um, Rohan said we went from wind to steam to oil. We're, we're going back to wind so <laughs> in terms of shipping. Uh, so I think at, at the moment, my role is really to ensure the people with the good ideas and are risky are getting through into industry and are implemented. And that's my sole role. Okay, wonderful. 
Thank you, Clyde. And Lauren, can I ask you a quick question? From your time spent at the DOT, which is very, very valuable, uh, could you share some perspectives of, uh, or some challenge, some of the one initiative or one challenge that you dealt with in dealing with uh, you know, policy making for transportation? Uh, I, I, I would say infrastructure uh, permitting. Um, in, in the U.S., we have a very elaborate uh, and important system of envir environmental impact statements uh, that are done before any major infrastructure uh, project can be undertaken. Uh, and just sort of generally the infrastructure uh, production process from start to finish. It is extremely expensive, uh, especially in developed areas, to establish uh, new infrastructure projects. Uh, and that has been, um, you know, something that that uh, that uh, you've got two major political parties in the U.S. You know, over the past uh, you know twenty years in particular, a lot of work done. Um, by you know, presidential administrations of both parties trying to improve that process, uh, major uh, surface transportation legislation to improve that. I, I would say being able to, to to build stuff and put stuff on the roads uh, and just to establish the different streams. I mean, uh, Rohan is absolutely right about maritime shipping. It's super important, uh, you know, so out of sight, out of mind to most people, uh, but it's an incredibly important part. So I think Rohan was alluding to port infrastructure. We need to have our port infrastructure. We need to have our multimodal uh, infrastructure, especially freight, uh, that sort of freight infrastructure. And I think that freight technology and uh, bringing technology to bear on uh, on infrastructure is going to be um, incredibly important because it's really hard to uh, to, to build new stuff uh, in, in, in developed areas. And I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we're dealing with right now. Uh, you're on mute, VJ. That darn mute button. It's our new COVID age, the virtual meetings. We leave our I agree. I Thank you for that. Nico, quick question for you. I know that, uh, uh, you know, growing up, your dream was to be a pilot, and you've also been always passionate about preserving the environment. So how have these seemingly contradictory passions helped you shape, help shape your work at Connect? I think uh, <clears throat> to bring it back to just one point, it is about uh, leadership. It is about accommodating conflicting interests and dealing and how to bridge uh, the fact that you want to improve the welfare of a society, but also you want to make sure that there is a well-being. And this kind of new leadership we needed in the entire industry. Uh, May the 26th, the uh, fossil industry experienced their Black Wednesday when Chevron, uh, Shell and Exxon were limited by either a judge or their shareholders. And in the companies, the leaders are developed um, for 30 years by running a commercial company and then become the CEO. Nothing wrong with running a commercial company, but we now need leaders who can um, deal with a transition or who can even deal with a disruption. So I think uh, bridging uh, conflict of interest is what is up to our generation to change. And thank you, uh, VJ, for your excellent way of uh, moderating this. Thank you. Thank you as well. I, want to, I know we're going to get booted out in a minute, but I want to take a minute to thank all the panelists for their excellent insights and very, very enjoyable as well. And I want to thank the audience for making time to be here. And I also want to thank Frank and his excellent team at Harassus for making this happen. Uh, I think it has been a fascinating uh, session and a learning experience yes. for me. And I hope the audience found it very exciting as well. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Are we still live?